if you said to me to describe this story, I would say, don't believe it, but it's true. I can't even imagine somebody doing something like this. It's also the perfect crime, because sometimes the thing that's blatant right in front of your face is a thing you don't expect. I was going to be a million dollar winner. I was game for something exhilarating. From 1989 to 2001, there were almost no legitimate winners of the high value game pieces in the McDonald's Monopoly game. Uncle Jerry told me, if you want a game piece, this is how it's done. Hello and welcome to the bonus episode of McMillions. This is not James or Brian. It's way better. This <laughs> is successful podcaster and comedian Tom Segura. <laughs> and I have been asked to host this episode. I am here with James Lee Hernandez and Brian Lasarte, the executive producers and directors of McMillions. Gentlemen, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to speak with you on the bonus episode. Well, thanks. This has been really fun ride for us. Obviously, we've never done podcasts before, so yeah. This is so. Are you hooked now? Are you podcasters? You think you're going to start doing it all the time? Uh, it's pretty awesome to be able to do it. It kind yeah. of is, right? Yeah, like the turnaround time is fantastic. Doing a TV show takes like two years. Yeah, I remember. Like, so for people that don't know, I heard about this project from you, Brian, initially. I mean, it it was quite a while ago. Was it two years ago? It was 2017. 2017. Yeah. Working on three years. Yep. Yeah. And I still remember you telling me, you know, that this whole McDonald's Monopoly thing, it's crazy. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, tell me something. You're like, nah, I can't. <laughs> and I was like, so what is it? You're like, it's going to be multiple episodes. And I'm like, how? And then now I've watched it. And I'm like, oh, now I understand. Yeah, it's, it's worthy of many episodes. Ah, oh, thanks. Yeah. The idea of the bonus episode really spawned from a number of questions that we still haven't been able to answer for the show. There's been a great deal of tweets about the show that are are quite incredible. And because there was a great deal of humor we wanted to inject in the show, and we always felt like this would be a great way to bring someone who is an expert in comedy, and, and who better th that we know, that I know, than you. Yeah, no. On top of it being a highly entertaining, engaging fun series to watch i mean there are just laughs throughout and i think for multiple reasons like number one i think just the idea of like if you just take the idea of a scam of a fast food chains monopoly game that in of itself is kind of funny you know yeah and then for sure just the wild cast of characters that you have they are characters that you can't even write if you wrote them people would be like this you're this is ridiculous <laughs> robin is is a ridiculous person <laughs> she is amazing it's it's so interesting that like it's just her thought process of of life just every mm -hmm. everything that she talks about is is great and she has this charm to her where you yeah. can, like, talk to her for hours well that's the thing is like i mean when you watch her on the series you're amused and you're you're just I, I kind of in awe of like studying a human being. You're like, this is a real person. Like from <laughs> from the way she thinks and speaks to the way she dresses and you know, and yeah. and also just being like, ah, I guess I married a Columbo, you know. I mean, like, <laughs> it's all it's all ridiculous. Um and then of the winners, you know, there's some of them have that sense of like you can't help but think that Gloria is just actually this super kind, wonderful person. That's how she comes across that made this mistake and it's literally breaking. And every time you see her, I actually just feel nothing but terribly for her that, that she met Robin, who's now her friend, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's just like this, you know, but then there's people who I, I almost get like a little excited every time I see their face pop on screen, <laughs> like AJ. Yeah. I find I actually find Devro to be just I get excited because I think he's gonna say something kind of slick <laughs> every time. <laughs> and like, you know, like then we took it to him. <laughs> like we took his ass down. Like he's like <laughs> that's who you want being a prosecutor. You know? Yeah. It seems like it's straight out of casting. Oh, for sure. Uh, like with with Devro, his whole job was to be a showman. And that's what a trial attorney is, especially for the US government. Mm -hmm. And 
there was this point where he had talked about he had this entire opening statement written out that he was going to try and slide in as many McDonald's references into his opening statement in court mm -hmm. as possible. He he didn't fully do it, but there were quite quite a few they threw in. But like that guy is a federal prosecutor, yeah, like, for the United States government. He loves it. You yeah. can tell that. Yeah, this is it is not a drag for him to get up in the morning and throw no. on his double breasted suits and go to work <laughs> that he has been rocking since the nineties, right? <laughs> because I saw the footage then and now. He's like, this is my shit. Double breasted suits. <laughs> it's Doug Matthews like shits on. Devro's, you know, choice of clothing. Say so uh -huh. he still wears the same shit today. Like at least yeah, that yeah, style. Yeah. And well, Doug needs. I mean, I'm not the only one that knows. Doug needs shirts that fit. That's a really oversized white shirt that he's wearing. It's because he's ripped. What, what do you mean? Well, like you know, <laughs> <laughs> tell us more, Brian. I mean, isn't isn't it like I, I always felt that way? Like you know, dudes who are like, oh, he wears as, a form fitting yeah, like, shirt. Yes, yeah. you know, it'll be like showing off almost. I thought you were saying like, as a ripped guy, you always felt like you needed bigger shirts. That's definitely that's, how it that's sounded. that's the re <laughs> <laughs> it definitely was like I relate I re to Doug. <laughs> we have similar bodies. <laughs> we need the extra wide V shirt. Yeah. It is a huge button down. I, I get what you're saying. I'm. Th I, I. I think that Doug should go like maybe a size, size or two smaller. Smaller. Yeah. Don't be so ashamed, Doug. You worked hard for that body. Let people see it. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about Robin. There's so many people who were asking questions about her, commenting about things in the show. One thing in particular was the Wheel of Justice. Yeah. Spin the wheel of justice. Let's spin the wheel and see who it lands on this week. Looks like we're going to come up on Ms. Colombo. She's been on the wheel a couple of weeks. Okay, Robin Colombo is wanted for Grand Theft Auto. If you know where she is or any of the suspects on the wheel, please call Crime Stoppers. That number is 866-845-TIPS. Officer Hartley, thank you. Always a pleasure. Oh, man, that is 100% real and still happens in Jacksonville. So on the news, it's on a local, spin the wheel of justice? Yeah, it's a local news thing. It's been happening since back then. Mm -hmm. And they'll do a, a, a weekly thing where they spin that wheel. And, and whoever it lands out. on. That's their, like, the fugitive profile. of the week. Okay. Yeah. But so we thought that this was like a night, like a nineties. They're like, like no, no, no. And we checked it out, and they still do they this still to this do day. It. Sounds very Jacksonville. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've yeah. been there quite a few times. She did, by the way, <laughs> want to assure us that she didn't actually steal the car mm -hmm. because you know it was Grand Theft Auto is what she was up for at that yeah. time, wanted for. Oh, by the way, I have to ask you this: in the episode, you know how they go, the FBI guys like Doug and everything, you ask who the source was, right? And right. they're like, I'll never reveal the source. And there's this kind of, I guess, almost like a you misdirect or you think that it was Lee right. who informed the IRS who then told them and Doug dismisses that. And you finally see that it was Jerry Colombo's mother. Right. Do you ever throw that at them that like we were told that? And to, to, to Robin? See, Oh, no, to no. the FBI. To the FBI, like to Doug and be like, hey, we, we were told it was. We, uh, we did, we just we wanted to yeah. corroborate it, and uh, they still wouldn't say. So oh, we, were, okay. we were able to corroborate in other ways, but yeah, the FBI, they're still fully on lockdown on it. Were you face-to-face -face when you threw it at them or no? Yes. Yeah. So you're like, we were told it was, and they yeah. was like, that's cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So Robin, by the way, we told Robin in advance. So in the end of episode five, she is convinced that it was Frank Colombo, right? That's the clip. Her brother-in-law. Yes. Right. The, episode five. The youngest Colombo brother. Mm -hmm. And so when before before this all started coming out and airing, we decided, okay, we were going to have the conversation with her so she's not blindsided by this mm -hmm. because she still is in contact. Like she calls her mother-in-law every day. Like, well, yeah. I mean, they're still, yeah. they're still you friends. See the yeah. show. You see that she's yeah. like, so, and this is like, we didn't film it or anything like that, but we just wanted to let her know and let yeah, Francesco, just, her son, know. Were you guys, were you guys like, are you sitting down? Yes. Yeah. It was like, just as human beings, we felt like, if the, I, I wouldn't want that to happen to me or somebody I care about and just get blindsided by that on a TV show. Mm -hmm. So we talked to him about it and they, Robin really had su suspected something like that the entire time. Yeah. 
And it was it was too convenient of how everything went down and when she was supposed to get out of prison and what was going on with Francesco, her son. And she sort of knew, and this is really just confirming that. Right. And so she immediately after we told her called Ma Colombo. And and uh Ma just bawled and, you know, admitted to it. And then how did that affect Robin? She said, This doesn't change anything between us. Mm. They've really put the past behind them. And yep. wow. she, had, forgave, she forgave her. Yeah. Like to how Robin is and that like I, I love her and I would take care of her. Like it it really hasn't changed anything. She said, like, I've done I've said and done so much shit to them and the fact that like we are where we are currently, mm-hmm. like it does why would it change anything? She was like, I've threatened them. I've threatened the FBI on them. I you know, like I've you know Right. She, yeah, she did some shit over the years. I've said some nasty things yeah. to right. my famous criminal family that I married into. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Francesco is probably more surprised by it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what, like, it, I know it's covered, but like, what prompted, like, the mother, Ma Colombo, to act? She just. Oh, so the whole, the why she did the entire thing was after Jerry Colombo passed away, Robin then was in and out of prison. And it was who was going to take care of her son, Frankie. And because he was the first grandchild and a male in the Sicilian culture, they were really, really passionate about him and how he was going to be raised. And so they wanted to raise him. And then there was Robin's parents who were also trying to raise him. And something that we really couldn't go into in the show, there was a legal battle between the two of them of who was going to get custody. And then on top of that, then Robin was going to get out of prison. Mm -hmm. So she would just automatically get, get Frankie. And that led to, all right, well, they knew that Robin was part of this. They knew that her father was part of this. And that just immediately would eliminate that side of the family. Yeah. Jeez. So there's a lot, there was a lot of drama within that. And we touched upon it. Yeah. The whole time you're holding on for the explanation of how Jacobson did it. Oh, yeah. How did he steal the game pieces? Yeah. And some part of your mind assumes something like what happened, right? Because yeah. the whole time you're like, well, I mean, it's got to be some version right. of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then when it's happening, you're like, okay, okay, okay. But then the fact that they're like, Oh yeah, he stickers were just mailed to him. Like what? Yeah, that seems so crazy. It was absolutely random. And then they're like, you know, without the stickers, he couldn't have done it. And you're like, so how did they were just mailed to him? Yeah, like accidentally. Yep. Yeah. So the company that makes them, they had this company out of uh, out of China that was printing these holographic stickers that you just can't forge. And they were supposed to send them to one of the B- VPs, and they ended up accidentally sending it to the head of security. Oh, so they're like, you're the safe guy to yeah, exactly these secure things. And they didn't realize what they were doing. And instead of him being like, oh, I got sent these by mistake. Because the stickers are the key to the whole thing. Right. That was, that was the whole deal. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And then I was kept thinking that the CPA that he was traveling with must have been like, man, this dude takes long dumps every time <laughs> in an airport. Because <laughs> for him to like open the thing, pull them out, yeah. count them, make sure they're back, put the cigarette gun, right? You know, it's like, she's probably like, God, he has diarrhea every time we travel. <laughs> yeah. What, 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 what was it? Or, like, she's either the dumbest. Oh, right. So the, the FBI immediately started looking at Hilda Bennett, who was the accountant that would go with him on all these trips. On all the trips, yeah. So Jerry's head of security, he would keep saying, oh, keep giving me her, keep giving me her. And you should be rotating that person. Really, Jerry should be rotated at all And in all fact, times. when they switched accounting firms, he recommended that she get hired at the new accounting firm that was going to be traveling with him. Yeah. Because he knew that he could get away with it with her. Right. Within the show, you hear Marsha, his ex-wife, who was head of security at Dittler, or Jerry Jacobson's ex-wife. Which ex-wife now are we talking the, about? This is ex-wife number, number four. four. That was another funny beat. <laughs> she's like, I'm the third, and it says fourth on the screen. And then she's like, ah, oh, not fourth. <laughs> <laughs> she says that that was really where the loophole was with this, is that there's no way that she, the same person should have been going, and then she should have not ever let him be alone with that briefcase. Mm-hmm. And so to be able to take that amount of time and all of that, the FBI looked into it and were convinced for a while that she had to be part of it. Like, There's no way that she could not have known. And so... They said uh, either she is uh, the dumbest person we've ever met or a criminal mastermind. 
wow, I guess. Uh, yeah. Like they looked into her bank records. The person. <laughs> right. <laughs> they looked at her bank records. They wiretapped her and listened to all the conversations yeah, between her and Jerry. It was nothing. Yeah. In fact, wow. she, she had another account that she was working for her company and she called out like $200 that was missing. It, there was some there was some story that we'd heard from I think Tom Kinnear who yep. had said that like because you know she like took this completely professional approach with this other client yeah for two hundred dollars right like why would she that character trait just doesn't line up with someone who is like involved in what Jerry yeah. was involved with interesting yeah. yeah he needed the perfect yeah. accomplice or mm-hmm. unwilling accomplice right yeah. she she did not want to sit down with us. She yeah. said this was one of the darkest times in her entire life. The past is the past. I was about to say how much fun it seemed like to pull this thing off, you know. Like, <laughs> I mean, you kind of want to be Jerry for a second without ruining everyone's life. You know what I mean? Like the excitement of his... <laughs> 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 I mean, it's just like, it's, it's the kind of story where you go like, oh man, I can see why it would be an addictive... Yeah, right. It's the know, poor man's thrill. Ocean's Eleven. Yeah, it's, it's, it really uh, is. You it's know? the power, right? And... Without that call, right, you go, does this ever get blown up? Yeah, could have gone on for for as long as McDonald's is going to run the game. People were winning. As long as nobody comes forward and rats this out, and it's it just keeps going and going. And I wonder if he had that, like his son said, had money buried somewhere, you know? Who knows? Uh, it, makes, it makes sense. I mean, if you're dealing in cash, you know, where are you going to put all that? Of course. A little bit with each ex-wife be a lot of money if it adds up. Well, we, we yeah. always thought that one of the reasons he did this was because the alimony payments he had for all the ex-wives. Yeah, like six he, wives. Uh, it was one of the early ex-wives who were talking about how poor they were. <laughs> one of the early ex-wives. <laughs> <laughs> He's had more marriages than Elizabeth Taylor, I think. Is that? I think about the same. Yeah. Seven. Seven. He's on right. the seventh, yeah. yeah. Which is a lot. I'm That's... not trying to downplay it. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's not that many. But yeah, he was always in that boat of how am I going to afford alimony payments an interesting thing that jared uh his son talked to us about of his dad wasn't in the picture at all until he got a court order basically to start paying child support payments and seeing his son again yeah this i mean this really ruined his son's life jared um, the way that jared talks about it his son was you know the part of the police explorer program Mm -hmm. which was like you can start it when you're 15 and it helps you kind of become it's like transition to police officer but it's like a like like boy scout it's rotc yeah but for the police and like right when he was about to join the police force he told his dad who was you know former police officer like hey i'm gonna join the police and his dad was like why would you do that you'd be a terrible cop cool dad yeah Thanks. I mean, this is, you know, this is what he said. And, yeah. And wow. It also stands out in the, um, in the show when you realize when it went down and that September 11th was shortly thereafter. It makes sense because like, that happens when big stories bury right. other things. That Jacobson, Jerry, must have in the last few years been like, oh, glad this thing is gone, gone like right. behind me. And I mean, there was, there was a lot of people. I mean, no one then, was happy about no, it's 9-11. This right yeah. now. No, no. But I'm saying like right now, finally, like all oh, these years yeah, yeah, later, yeah, yeah. Right. it's like, it's not a story. Right. No one's, yeah, I'm sure he's walking around. No one's being like, you're Jerry Jacobson, right? You know? Yeah. And then <laughs> this kind of, he's like, God damn it. <laughs> like all over again. Yeah. Which I mean, you know, it's that, that comes with it when you run an operation like this, you know, that's, it's going to come out, but it has to like really jar the person involved, all the people yep. to be right. like, oh, we're, our faces and names are out there again. Yeah. For, for Jacobson in general, he's the type of person that, from what we've, what we've learned in the show that he almost can will things to not exist. Mm-hmm. Like the rationalization of what he's doing, stealing all these game pieces and selling them like, isn't that bad same rationalization of like, if I don't put any credence into it, it doesn't exist in my life. Uh And one thing that his defense attorneys talked about was, especially like Janice Singer talking about how like, your life shouldn't be decided or how people view you by one thing that you've done and you can pay for that and get retribution and, and be able to live the rest of your life. But unfortunately you made decisions in your past that will come back to haunt you and, and, you just can't fully control that. Of course, that's just the way life goes, right? Right. Another thing that stands out, I think, 
in the series. And this is something that we all were taught this as kids and we're, remi- we're you're reminded of it all the time. But I think in a series like this, it, it really stands out is that you never know what someone is capable of and who they are and what they, you know what I mean? Right. Like you always, you make assumptions that somebody looks like this. Right. That's somebody who would steal or that's somebody who's a criminal. Or, and then throughout the series, you're just seeing all these people. And some of them, you know, you like I said, you, you go like, this is a good person. They made a bad decision. Like if I saw AJ just sitting in a coffee shop, I'd be like, oh, what a nice older man. <laughs> like, he probably plays bridge and likes to pass the time listening to classical music. He's like, I'm a drug runner. I fucking went to Monte Carlo. And, like, I've been in prison multiple times. You know what I mean? And then you see Jerry Jacobson, same kind of thing. Like you just be like, that's just never, a, yeah. You would never you would know. Know. look at yeah. him twice. You wouldn't look at him twice. Yeah, yeah. You know? that was part of the thing. Obviously, Jerry is not in the show. Jerry Jacobson. Yeah. We. We tried relentlessly and, and still probably will try until someday I actually get to talk to him face to face. And now mm-hmm. it's just like this weird obsession. It would have been awesome, of course. Yeah. With AJ, with Jerry, you, with without having him in the show. We were able to learn a great deal beyond just details of his past. Learn very much about w- what his current situation is right now and had some some line of communication that got to him. So, you know, we do know he has not seen the show, whether that's partly because he doesn't have HBO or he just doesn't <laughs> have it. <laughs> we can hook him up if he needs. Ah, uh, is that part of his restitution? <laughs> <laughs> no HBO. <laughs> Premium channels. <laughs> PBS only. Okay. Good. Uh, and then, uh, but he does, ha- he knows the content of the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's had people tell him what's in it and, and what people are saying. I bet, dude. I'm sure people have I'm sure people walk up to him like, hey man. <laughs> <laughs> well n- now it now it is. I mean, obviously now people might recognize him in some yeah. capacity. That's what I'm saying to yeah. him. I would not think it's outrageous at all that if you were to find him right now, today, he has a full beard. I mean, it's even like Rick Dent. Who was the? Who didn't appear? Who also. didn't appear? Yeah. Right. right. We, we talked to him. A, a we know lot, he's got though. a big head, but that's yeah. all we know. <laughs> huge head, and yeah. I mean, we've seen it in person. It's huge. It's huge. Devro Devro said, like, when you guys interview Dent, you're gonna have to get the widest lens you can find. Really <laughs> fit his head in it. <laughs> How big is his head? <laughs> He, he's just, a, he's a big guy. Oh, okay. It's, yeah. It, it doesn't look disproportionate. Because it sounds like it. The way we're talking is <laughs> uh, a regular guy with just an enormous head. Bobble head. Yeah. Rick Dent, he knew, he said, the moment I signed that affidavit, like this, this case was going to haunt him for the rest of his life. Dent said that? Dent yeah. said Why? that. Why? He just, he knew because of McDonald's and, and everything that was so attractive about this case. He's like, I, I know this is going to come back and, and, come back to haunt me someday. But why would it haunt it. Dent? Because Dent just doesn't like the limelight. Oh, he I see. He doesn't like talking about it. I see. There's a lot he doesn't remember. And, and he would he was willing to answer questions, but just not on camera. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We even asked, like, could we, you know, do an audio recording of it? Just use your audio. And he was like, mm, no. Dwight Baker, yes. right, the Mormon. Yeah. I would never want anybody to go through the pain and the hell that the people that have been involved because of my behavior have had to go through. You pay for some bad choices. And the sad part is, everybody around you pays for your bad choices. Dwight Baker, right, he got busted by Doug Astraliga, Mm -hmm. which, you know, by the way, like having two Jerry's and two Doug's, you know, in the show certainly made it a little tricky. So Doug Astraliga was the tall, he was the lighting guy who yeah, looks just like Javier. Javier Bardem. He, right. he was a rookie at the same time as Matthews. They actually were at Quantico together. Right. So they were okay. super close friends. He was the lighting guy. He's the one that busted Dwight. He's the Correct. one that busted Dwight. So okay. Dwight, he busts Dwight while Dwight is being processed. Mm-hmm. Dwight says to him like, you know, I recognize you. Dwight Baker had gone to a wedding like a month prior. And Doug Astraliga followed him, like got on the plane with a marshal and like sat like in the other aisle, just like, you know, just making sure he's not like trying to run the country. Right? Yeah. And because there was also that tie in where like, 
Yeah, and so, but but Dwight Baker remembered seeing him on the flight uh-huh. with the marshal. But Dwight is another person. Back to what I was saying, that you feel like I would never suspect that this guy. Right. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. I believe that he's showing up extra early on Sunday to church yeah. and volunteer. I mean, you know, it just comes across that way. Right. Yeah. He's a Mormon elder, and to to get to that level in uh, Latter Day Saints is is pretty difficult and pretty high. It takes years and years and years. He's devastated. It seems like that he's excommunicated and mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. He's, it is wild that he recognized him though. Yeah. yeah. Now, did you feel any sympathy for him at the end? Did you feel like with George Chandler, like forgiving him? Like, I mean, you guys, this is a credit to you guys. I was floored when he was convicted you know, I was like, what? I mean, I just didn't... I, George Chandler? Yeah. The, the, yeah. the foster son? Yes, yeah. the foster son. And then I, you, I, I felt tremendous relief, happiness when his appeal was validated and, and you know, worked. And yeah, I mean, you, could, I could, you couldn't help but feel for, for both of them in that situation in the end. I mean, that, that George is forgiving him and you know that, you know that Dwight feels terribly. I mean, I think it reads. Like, I genuinely believe that he feels terribly for having brought his foster son into this horrible situation. So when we first met George and Dwight, we met them together oh, yeah. uh, at lunch. And they were like, we'll, we'll meet with you this one time, but we're not going on camera. Mm-hmm. And George, who rarely drinks, was so nervous. He had like... <laughs> He was like, I'll, I'll have another one. Like, yeah, he was pounding vodka tonics. What yeah. was he nervous about? <laughs> he was just nervous about talking about it. Just well, like, and part of it was this was, I think, the second time he had seen Dwight since the trial. That's true. Yeah. That's it? That was yeah. it. Yeah. We're like, oh, man, wish we could film this to like see. It was just a, a raw emotion between the two of them because there's just so much that has happened through their lives. I mean, it, it took a while for both of them to agree to go on camera. But, really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Seems like everybody didn't want to be on camera. On the FBI side, it's easy. Yeah, yeah. but I mean like the participants, right? Oh, like, yeah. It took a while of really telling them, we want you to tell your own story. We don't want people just telling the story for you. The guy who, one of the first episodes, I'm forgetting, is it Hooper? Uh, Hoover. Oh, Hoover. 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 Is he alive? Michael Hoover? He is, yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I was like, that guy's definitely dead. <laughs> he might, he, no, he is definitely alive. Oh. He, he did not want to go on camera at all. And for everyone who went on camera, mm-hmm. it changed how people perceive them. Sure. Right? If you only heard their story from the FBI's point of view, you would just think like, oh, there's some criminal ring. You, you would associate them with... But when you see their stories it humanizes them even yeah. even aj glum who was like yeah I, I did it he was like i i gave away 10 million dollars and i i took six hundred thousand. so how dumb am I, how stupid am i aj was like i'll do it again tomorrow yeah oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean to this day he pays like 160 a month right in restitution aj does yeah there's been a lot of comments on twitter about how people are like i can't believe they pay less than my student loans in restitution. Yeah. Like it does pay. Uh, what, what's the si- the saying about crime does pay? Crime, yeah, crime does pay. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, so with the white collar crimes, it's it's really different. And we at the beginning, like most people, assume like Jerry Jacobson's got to be in jail still. Like, right. These yeah, people yeah. probably served 15, 20 years. In actuality, it, it isn't like that. If you're taking money and you're not physically harming others. And a lot of times if you cut a plea deal like Jerry Jacobson did, they'll give you a pretty good deal. I mean, you'll owe a ton of money. But for Jerry Jacobson, like his lawyer, Ed Garland, says like he owed the government $13 million, but at a certain point that becomes irrelevant because he'll never be able to pay that back. Right. So he'll be saddled with this He's a character, by incremental. The way, but I, I could watch that dude talk. <laughs> yeah. Somebody on Twitter said uh, one of the craziest things is that they – Filmed the interview with Ed Garland and Janice Singer in the house from Knives Out. <laughs> <laughs> that is dead on. Yeah. yeah. That no, that was actually. I mean, that's a it's a beautiful house. I believe yeah. it. Yeah, it's a third generation attorney's house. Yeah. The idea that the restitution is so low, you got it's upsetting. It's upsetting, yeah. but you also have to remember that all of these people have like liens on any property that they have, mm-hmm. so they can't sell anything. When you're a federal criminal yeah you you don't have the same work and job opportunities that no but you you can't help but look at 
says twenty four million, right? And then he like, right. and he pays three hundred and sixty dollars a month. You're like, oh, does it, for a Honda? What is he? What What is that all about? <laughs> like, it seems like that should have a couple zeros at the end. You know. Well, right. part of it is it's percentage based. So if he was making a million dollars a year, the amount he'd be paying back. But they're all most of them are at retirement age. Mm-hmm. So this is really ta- being taken out of Social Security and pension. I wonder if if they do. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming at some point they were just like. We have to track this guy and surveil him to see if he's got, you know, he's going to the stash. Yeah. We wondered about that. Like, how does the government keep track of all, uh, keep track of all these people? Yeah. Like, if he had money stashed and all of a sudden he had a brand new truck in his driveway, is there somebody that, does that trigger, like, right? Is their next door neighbor been watching this entire time and all of a sudden the truck then is being impounded? But I guess not, huh? I mean, it's, it's about resources, right? Right. Well, like he said, though, when you say resources, the FBI says, you know, 9-11 happens, we all became terrorism agents. Right, right. Yeah. 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 I, they were lucky in a sense that the arrests happened before because after that, they're all fully in terrorism, and Devereaux had to then carry the rest of this case on his own. Wow. So th- there's, there's two things on, on Twitter. <laughs> so there's one major thing and one sub thing. The, the McMillions coffee. Frank and Heather Colombo ordering a coffee from McDonald's with 10 cream. Unreal. Five sugars. Five sugar. Yeah. Or 10 cream and five equal. Yeah. I mean, that's like drinking 42 Cokes, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that's it's way too much. Speaking of, uh, speaking of his family, a lot of people are really excited about uh, their youngest son's name. Oh, so they kept yeah. talking about, oh, this is our son Vinny or son right. Vinny. Well, Vinny works at McDonald's. Yeah. Right. Amazing. And then we saw his name tag, and they said his name. His name is Vintonio. Vintonio. It's like Vincent and Antonio combined. That's some real Sicilian shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. that name comes with olive oil, I think. I think it does, too. <laughs> hey, Vintonio. <laughs> what was your reaction when he popped on the screen? When Vintonio did? Yeah. Like, again, it just seems like too ridiculous to be true he's got a very nice stereo in his car and we heard him coming down like the street we heard him like blocks away because they're, so I, they're, love, I love that brian starts with he has a very nice stereo in his car <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we could it's a it. pioneer uh-huh. and so we had to like stop down for a second like okay obviously we can't keep filming he's gonna right. destroy sound yeah and then he walked in with that on and you're like no way <laughs> and you had no idea it was coming no clue Amazing. Blindsided. Speaking of surprises, one surprise was Grinnell Scott. During the time of Fuzzy Bunny, Grinnell Scott was the reporter that was always sent out for the field report on what was happening with the Fuzzy Bunny. The Fuzzy Bunny opened its doors just a half hour ago, opening the doors to a steamy controversy. Grinnell? Well, Debbie, we are here at the Fuzzy Bunny, which is located on Highway 78 in Royal, just down the road from the fairgrounds in Ladson, and the entertainment and the dancing have begun here at the club. The Fuzzy Bunny, which Jerry Colombo fought tooth and nail because it was important to him to stand up for a business he believed in. (laughs) And no matter how many times the city was like, this isn't going to fly here, he's like, I'm going to change it around and make it a church. (laughs) Yep. You know, he was was running strip clubs. Yeah. Yeah. Strip club named the Fuzzy Bunny. And in the report that Grinnell Scott did, you know what the thing is when you're watching it? Your head turns and Mm -hmm. then the information is so quick and and the story is so captivating your mind kind of moves on right. rapidly but you're like why is he in the strip club with like, with, <laughs> with this with the stripper in the background on the pole. with, on with the, the stripper like, i'm here pole. at the fuzzy bunny and you're like whoa whoa, whoa. like <laughs> most reporters do that outside the club They're like i'm standing outside the fuzzy bunny he was like no 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 i need to make sure this is a strip club <laughs> i mean did you guys ever Ask any questions about that or we, find out anything? We tried to get in contact with Gurnall, but I think he wanted to keep the fuzzy bunny behind him. Uh-huh. But it's also funny that like, it was always him that right. was sent out to do the reports. Like Every time you see him, those are all different instances, different reports he had to go out on. Uh-huh. And I mean, the first one, I don't know if there's a more 90s thing than seeing him in like a tan suede jacket yeah. with a stripper with cut-off jean shorts in the background. I'm reporting live from the Fuzzy Bunny. <laughs> well, so Jerry, Jerry Colombo wanted to create like a membership. You had to have a membership card. Uh-huh. And uh, there was actually awesome archival that we, we just 
didn't include. Otherwise, we would have had like a two-hour documentary episode yeah. on the Fuzzy Bunny. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a spinoff, just the Fuzzy Bunny. Are you? When does the new Fuzzy Bunny docu series debut? <laughs> well, uh, we're we're working on it. Sundance yeah. 2021. <laughs> But yeah, there was a membership, and and w- there was this. Do you remember that there was this older woman? Oh who was yeah, like, she, I got my membership card. <laughs> she, she was, was like so proud of early seventies, sitting at the bar drinking, and she was like so excited to, I guess, have somewhere to booze up yep. and pray and pray. And, yeah, yep. yeah. When it takes a little of the edge off, when you look at the girls, you're like, oh, you know. So there's also a great deal of irony in this series. Irony is like incredibly captivating. I thought you were just going to give us the definition. I, of irony. I totally did too. <laughs> irony for those of you that don't know, right? <laughs> but there are some things that are just like I mean, we talk about. You just could not script, like the name of the town that Dwight Baker and George Chandler live. Mm-hmm. Fair Play, South Carolina. Fair Play, yeah. And you know, we we don't really make whole big deal of it. We just kind of like put it up there, yeah. and if people catch it, they catch it. But like. It just it's so ironic. And and the slogan for the for the town is our name says it all. Yeah. That is kind of poetic. Right? Yeah. And you can't write this shit. No. Our name says it all. Fair play. And that's where Dwight and George Chandler live. Yeah. Yeah, and got busted. There somebody put on Twitter that they've all moved on from Baby Yoda and now people want to adopt Heather Colombo. Uh-huh. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> There was a lot of a lot of comments about how Heather was she was quiet throughout much of the series, but then she came out at the very end swinging, swinging. <laughs> like yeah. she is the punctuation mark to the whole series. The whole yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I felt that. Did you guys cover in your last podcast the faxing and how absurd that is? We uh, we talked about it a little bit, but it is it's unbelievable that this actually happened. Yeah, that I mean, that part, by the way, is, a, is yet another part of the story where if you had scripted this, I'd be like, that's so stupid, guys. No one's going <laughs> to speed fax it to the press from the FBI's <laughs> office. Like, that doesn't even make sense. Especially now with email and, yeah. and being able to do things quickly, you think, okay, you have to send a 50-page document via but it, fax. It came from the, wait, the Jacksonville office... So the way it happened was the Jacksonville office had to fax it to South Carolina. Right. And so they had to uh, fax it. They originally faxed it to Columbia, which is the main office in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And Columbia was like, that's actually not our jurisdiction. There's a a smaller Greenville office, and that's the closest to fair play. And that's where you need to fax this. Right. But for the FBI. Correct. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. But then they go like, "We, we speed dialed it? Right. They had the Greenville, they're called RA's resident agencies. Those are the smaller satellite offices. And on the speed dial, it said Greenville RA, and then below it was Greenville News. Uh. And they're right next to each other. A person just saw Greenville because they would do a lot of communications with newspapers to do press releases and things like that. And so they would have tons of different press on speed dial. Ridiculous, ridiculous set of events. Right. Yeah. And even like email existed back then. But they still had to fax it. The FBI protocol is you have to fax out these documents, and that's the way to do it. There's somebody in Hollywood that I heard, some big name who was like, still like, send me the fax. It's Barbara Streisand. What? Yes. She was like, send me the fax. That's awesome. <laughs> fax machine only. That's like the most diabolical power move you can pull on someone. Yeah, because now everyone's like, where am I going to get, how am I going to get this? Right. She's like, I don't give a shit. Go to Kinko's. I know that I But even if you go to Kinko's, (laughs) you've got to like, they've got to dust it off and bring it out, right? Kickstart it, I think. I don't I haven't seen one in a while. I don't do emails. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. You want to go through some questions? Sure. Thank you for all the listeners who have been sending us their questions. There's no way in the world we could have answered everyone, everyone's question on the show. So the first question comes from... You have a question from Brody Thomas. Did Doug Matthews ever get a chance to smash through a gate? We should mention that Brody Thomas, by the way, is seven years old. Oh, for Christ's sake. (laughs) (laughs) Have you ever shot a gun before? (laughs) 
Right. Hi, my name is Brody Thompson, seven years old. Yes. I've been watching McMillions with my dad, and I have a question. Did Doug Matthews ever get a chance to smash through a gate? Well, that is adorable. Has Doug met Batman? <laughs> First of all, thank you for watching the show. Thank you for allowing us to warp your mind as a child. That's the beauty of the show. It's you know, it's family friendly. Yeah, it's like fun it, for all ages, right? It's you true just, crime for everyone. It really is. I have a question that hopefully they'll email back. Did your parents make you cover your eyes during the fuzzy bunny portion of the show? Good question for Brody's dad. <laughs> right. I mean, it's how did you explain the fuzzy bunny to Brody, sir? <laughs> you're like that's where grown-ups go <laughs> that's work that's it's just dancing yeah. yeah yeah some places are open at night as far as we know doug has never smashed his car through a gate that probably would have been the end of his fbi career yeah he wanted to of course all right i'm so excited for this next question so this is gonna be from leslie richmond from phoenix my name's Leslie Richmond. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, and my question is about the relationship between Amy and Doug. Watching them both share the stories about their work with Shamrock Productions, it seemed like there was a real fondness um, between the two of them. And so I wondered if there was any chemistry or flirtation or potential for a romantic connection between the two of them back then. Really wondered if that came into play at all. I'll take this one, guys. Um, <laughs> please, please do. <laughs> For sure. So D Doug is married. Mm -hmm. and, uh, now. Yeah, and he was, he, he, was, he was married back then. Amy, okay. we, we actually have no conclusive evidence uh, to support yeah. or deny this claim. Yeah, they're so. both professionals. Right. And they, get a, they have great professional chemistry. It, uh, that comes across. Right. Felt like it, yeah. yeah. She was actually just featured in Elle magazine. They did yeah. a whole write-up about her. From this. From yeah. this, yeah. Oh, wow. Giving her a little credit. I mean, the you know for all these years that she really couldn't talk about it. Yeah. And then no one really knew her involvement to the degree that she got involved. I love how easy to manipulate we are as men. Oh, where yeah. Where every guy was like, I think she likes me. <laughs> 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 like every guy was like, no, she definitely likes she, me. She, she, wait, smi she smiled at wait, me. Wait, oh, yeah. Sure. A, nice a woman talked to me. Mm. Yes. A woman mm. talked to me, made eye contact and smiled. She's into me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's what every guy thought. Yep. Uh, all right, next all question right. comes ne from... Next one's also great. Mike Miller. I'm really hoping this is the Mike Miller that went to University of Florida and played in the NBA. Please explain to me the, quote, the moral of the story, there are no free lunches, but there may be brownies hidden somewhere. In your last episode, AJ Galum says he knew what that means, but I'm still trying to figure it out. My wife's still, still trying to figure it out. I got to believe there's other people still trying to figure out what it means. <laughs> so if you can, just spend a little bit more time on that. Thank you. Great show. Well, thanks for the compliment, Mike. We don't fully know what it means other than the fact that it feels like it alludes to uh, what Jared Jacobson, Jer Uncle Jerry's son, was talking about where there, there might be some money buried somewhere. Those are those three brownies. Mm, I love brownies. <laughs> What's your interpretation of that line? Um, my interpretation of that line is just that there's hidden, like nothing of super substance is free, right? But that you can get little treats for free. <laughs> so that's actually a, that's good. Yeah, I, I, that's like you're not going to get away with stealing millions, but. If you have some good friends, you can steal less and get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the beauty of this is it's left to interpretation. Yeah. Right. You can, it can mean so many different things. Mm -hmm. It's like the ism. It's one of those things that should be used more in society. Hopefully in five years. Like, you know, there might be that. some brownies hidden somewhere. Oh. Right. Like I if you it. said that to somebody, mm -hmm. like we, you should know what that means. Yeah. You know who knows what that means? Criminals. <laughs> it's a very like criminal thing to say yeah like when phrases like i bet you if you asked any criminal that they would all be like oh yeah 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 i feel like that <laughs> but like good decent people like uh mike miller are like i, I go to work every day what's free <laughs> now there are a lot of and people aj is like i know exactly what that means oh exactly that's <laughs> right. what i'm saying 
So now Marsha, we, lo- we love Marsha. She had a, a number of great lines and, and great information to share with us. But the number one thing that people are asking about with Marsha online is, uh, <laughs> is that dog that's next to her real? Or alive or if alive. it is real. And it absolutely is. It just, it was so docile and like... Yeah. It would actually, it was like knocked out for this entire six hour interview. And at certain points it was, it would start snoring. <laughs> really? <laughs> we had to like wake it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where did uh, Lee live? Lee is in Jacksonville. I mean, a lot of people are probably wondering if Lee knows, right? At this point, yes, she knows. And if, you know, if she ever got in trouble. It's really a giant mystery. Like we were even asking the FBI, like, do you remember Lee? And they were like, no. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah, they don't they don't remember. All right, next question. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ben. In the first episode, you explained that this contest was very lucrative for McDonald's and that they had decided to run it one last time to help the FBI. My question is, did they do anything charitable with the increased revenue from this last contest that they knew was fraudulent? That's a damn good question. And is it above our pay grade? Well, they did run a, a, an entire game where they gave away $25 million, a million dollars a week, just to random customers in stores to make up for everything that had happened. And this was actually spearheaded by Amy Murray. So they didn't actually run this through another marketing company. This, like, Amy was going to different stores and they were doing this thing where they would randomly tap someone on the shoulder and says, and say, we're giving you a million dollars. Damn. Yeah. yeah. And so, and there, uh, Good Morning America, I think at the time, did something. We were trying to track that down, but we found out about it pretty late. So, yeah. and then uh, I think I, I saw in the end, it was was in the last episode that they said they still do it to this day. I, I was confused by that. They, they, they've they done do versions. versions. Yeah. Like while we were filming all of the bulk of this stuff in October of 2018, they were running a game for Halloween. It was the trick or treat game, but it was. The same, the same deal, thing, same basically. peel off, same. Right. But you could only win up to fifty thousand dollars. So that's part of the, oh, yeah. the mm. thing. Yeah. Not Bummer. the same. Yeah, yeah. If no. they bring it back, I mean, the, the question would be like, would people play it? Would it? I think they would. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. it would probably be bigger than ever probably. because of the excitement of yeah. the show yeah. and the excitement to be like, can I steal these pieces and sell them? To <laughs> <laughs> but the in terms of charitable contributions, they did give a donation to St. Jude's Children's Hospital, Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, we we talk about throughout the series that the pieces were not transferable Mm -hmm. and that in episode six, Mark Devereaux explains that, like, because they were non-transferable, they decided to give them a donation. Because everybody who got in trouble had to pay restitution, had to give that money back, had they not done that, had they actually paid it out like the game, the real question would have been like, okay, is St. Jude's on the hook to pay it back? Right. Right. Mm-hmm. So giving them a donation was a was a really good move and, and helped them. In the and what is the story well. again? A reminder of uh, how it ended up at St. Jude's? Like who gave it to him? Oh, uh, yeah. Uncle Jerry. Jerry so Jacobson. He sent it into St. Jude's because someone was supposed to buy a piece and they backed out at the last minute. There was an expiration time of when you had to redeem the pieces. So he was like, well, I got to do something with it. And he sent it to St. Jude's. That's the story we've heard from two different people. That seems like a nice thing for a criminal mastermind to do. Yeah. Gentlemen, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It is absolutely fascinating to watch this incredible series that you guys put out. But it was just an unbelievable story. And are, are you going to continue to do more podcasts? There's the possibility. If the audience is interested mm-hmm. in hearing more, yeah. uh, we are certainly down to continue. Well, look, regardless of whether the podcasts continue, the people can still continue to write emails for the time being. Whatever happens with that, I'd just like to tell the audience that March 24th, my new special, Ball Hog, comes out on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got a sneak preview. It's hilarious. Hope HBO lets that stay in. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we definitely want to thank you, Tom, for being here and doing this with us. It's so awesome to sit in here and chat with you and thank the audience for listening and diving into this crazy world with us. Oh, it was a thrill. I mean, this thing really got my fun meter going, you know. <laughs> <laughs>
This has been a lot of fun for us. We had a lot of fun coming even on your podcast, your mom's house. You guys were great guests on uh, your mom's house, episode 541. We got into, you know, different aspects of the series and, and how it all came about. So if people want to check it out, you guys were both on there. Thank you all for watching the series and thanks for listening to the podcast. This podcast was produced by Fun Meter in conjunction with Unrealistic Ideas. For Fun Meter, I'm Brian Lazarte. And I'm James Lee Hernandez. Joe Fenstemaker produced this episode. Our consulting producer is Barry Finkel from Pineapple Street Studios. JP Hesser mixed this episode. The music heard here comes from our actual series and was composed by Pinar Toprak. Unrealistic Ideas is Mark Wahlberg, Stephen Levinson, and Archie Gibbs. And of course, none of this would have been possible without the amazing support of HBO. You can find the McMillions podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, the HBO Go, and now apps, or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, thank you all for listening. Peace out.